Uh, okay, hi everyone. Now, in this case is hello Derek. So I will be covering chapter four. Uh, in the last chapter, we explored how to predict a quantity variable. So in this one, in this chapter, we will be looking at a couple of methods to predict now a qualitative or categorical variable or response. And uh, these, these are the main objectives. Uh, compare why we need to use other set of models instead of simply in a regression for this uh, different type of response, like the categorical one. And as it's mentioned here, uh, learn about this type of models for classification, uh, explore a little bit of them, and then compare them. Uh, in the end, we're going to see even a, a more different type of model for classification, but that example would shed light on the fact that this many of these cases that we have seen, that is in a regression, the one that we will see logistic, and the other one that we will see soon was some regression, uh, they fall into a, a greater category uh, for classification which are called generalized linear models, I think. Yes, in this section. Uh, and I will be using the notes from the previous couple. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, in this classification setting, the response is going to be a categorical variable. Uh, these are some of the methods that we are going to be looking at. For example, this one over here, uh, K nearest neighbors. Uh, we already explored it in the third meeting. I think you there were the one who explained it. Uh, and well, there are a couple of examples about how these uh, classification settings come up. I We don't really need to delve into each of the examples because there is quite a lot to cover, but Something interesting that they mentioned in the book is that in real life, actually classification problems tend to be more common than linear regression, sorry, than regression ones. So we may we may expect to to perhaps explore a little bit more uh, these tools for predicting categorical values. But first, uh, where are the previous why does the, does the preview to, previous tools that we already covered, why do they fail to predict categorical values? In this case, we focus on linear regression. Why does it fail? Uh, it's really meant to, it's mainly due to two issues. One is uh, the encoding that you perform for your categorical value. In this case, the categories are a stroke, epileptic seizure and drug overdose, but decoding or encoding that uh, they are doing it in order to fit such categories into a model using that training that data is to assign numbers to such categories. Uh, and the encoding problem, uh, uh, it means that sometimes or really most of the time, it's not quite clear which numbers uh, are appropriate to encode to these categories because a, a difference in this case of from two to one uh, can be the same as this difference from three to two, but that's, that doesn't imply that there is an equal difference from a stroke to epilept epileptic seizure than to epileptic seizure than to, to drug overdose. So this is one of the main problems, the, the encoding for Categories to numbers. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, however, uh, there is one case in which linear regression can provide useful information when we try to predict some category. And that is if the category, sorry, if the response is a dummy variable. That is, uh, it consists only of two categories. In this case, I consider this response Y. 
uh, they label the category stroke via the number zero and the category drug overdose via the number one. And if you were to, to fit a linear regression model uh, for some training data and this response, as they do over here, for example, in this in this picture for balance and the probability of uh, well, not, not in this specific case, but some numerical, some predictor balance, and then some probability of 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 observing some category in the data. In this case, a category is a fault. And they have this data, training data in orange. And when they apply a linear regression model, we obtain this uh, blue, uh, yes, this blue line. However, this blue line is supposed to represent probability, but as we can see in the graph, uh, actually we're getting negative values. So, uh, because we are supposed to be representing probability, uh, such values should be between zero and one. However, when we apply the tool that we are going to be covering uh, now, that is logistic progression, now the probabilities, that is this curve in blue, uh, it does fall into the interval zero to one. So it is a good estimate for probabilities. And, and that's going to be the, the use of the models that we're going to see. In us, in us, it's not only to predict which category does some observation fall into. That is, if some observation uh, is related to a stroke category or a drug overdose category. But really, we're going to be estimating probabilities. Probability that some observation lies in some category. And uh, such estimations are what we are looking at uh, over here in, in these blue lines. So let's start with the first model. Uh, it's very similar to the linear regression. This one is called logistic regression. Uh, and th there is a, an error in the function. Okay, I will fix it later. So for the logistic model, we're going to be modeling the probability that the response, no, sorry, that. Um, I think this, this is the other way. It should be the probability that Y belongs to a particular category. Sorry, the probability that X, I know that Y belongs to a particular category. Yeah, it's okay. This was a formula that we saw for linear regression, but now our estimate of the probability for this observation, this PX, is going to be given via this function called the logistic function. So if we take the logarithm of this, sorry, if we divide PX uh, via one minus PX, and then we take the log, then the, this expression becomes this over here. That is the log it. And now we can see that this value is depending linearly in the predictor. We will be simply working in the case of, uh, of one predictor, X, and our category is going to be binary. I think the notation here is kind of weird. Y is binary, not X. X is a predictor. Okay, it doesn't matter. So this is the case, X, one predictor, and only two possible categories. And we are estimating the probability that the observation lies in some specific category via this function. So of course, this is a parametric model. This is the parameters, beta sub zero and beta sub one. So we need a, a concise way to estimate such parameters. Uh, we could do the way of, of linear regression of working with the uh, MSE, that was the mean squared error. Uh, however, there is going to be a, I don't want to say better, but at least it makes more sense in this context of classification <clears throat> of using another, another fit for our parameters. And that will be the maximum likelihood. And uh, the main idea is we have our probabilities. 
for the observations, the probability is that they belong to some class, let's say to class one, and uh, we find this likelihood function, it's going to be simply the probabilities of these observations uh, over the cases where their, their response is associated to the class one. And then this product, you also multiply it by these another values when these probabilities are considering observations for, for which their class is zero. We simply want to maximize this product over here. Uh, well, and once you do that, uh, you get these parameters, beta sub zero, beta sub one, and now your estimation of the probabilities is what we saw in this case, this curve in blue. In this case, where we have one predictor and one dummy variable as the response, then yeah, the graph is always, it's always going to be this kind of S, where as you can see, the values are going to be always between zero and one, thanks to this definition over here of the logistic function. Because exponential function uh, for the real numbers behaves quite nicely. So we can guarantee that the estimation of the probability lies in the interval from zero to one. Now, we can, we can consider the case where we are still trying to predict a dummy variable. There is only two categories, but now we have more than one predictor. In this case, we have p predictors. So really, the, the logistic function, uh, it's pretty similar. Simply this part over here is changing. So as we can see in the formula, we're simply considering more parameters for our model and still our estimation of the probability that the, uh, the observation X has some class or some category, uh, let's say category one, we're performing such estimation via this formula. Uh, again, we uh, we fit these parameters. So we fit, we fit this model that is we estimate these parameters uh, using a maximum likelihood method. But in this case, uh, well, I didn't see a formula in the book, but probably the likelihood function for this multiple logistic regression is probably the same. Uh, but now we don't consider this, but multiplying the probabilities uh, with respect to each of the categories that you have, and still trying to maximize that product. Uh, well, they skipped over an important part, but, but I mentioned in the, in the book that <clears throat> if, you, if you have a set of predictors and, and you apply it to, to some response, but then, ah, ah, via this logistic regression model, but then you consider even more predictors and you apply such logistic regression model to the same response, then you can see that there may be a change in, in the p-values associated to the coefficients that you get for your predictors. Um, it's mainly due to the, correl the possible correlation that there can be between your predictors as well. So uh, the main idea is that you have to be careful about that, about the interpretation of the logistic regression model uh, and the coefficients, because it, it doesn't mean anymore compared to the linear regression case that uh, one unit change in the predictor equals, uh, in this case, beta sub one change in the response, but now a one unit change in this predictor x1, while the other predictors are remaining constant, it produces, a, I think, a scaling of e to the beta sub one for the estimated probability. So the interpretation changes. Now, so far, we've been trying to predict a response that only consists of two categories. However, it's not quite difficult to generalize it. So try to predict some set of categories that consist of two, sorry, of more than two classes. Uh, and such model receives the name of 
multinomial logistic regression. Uh, again, we start by fixing some baseline. In this case, we've been fixing the probability that y equals one, given the observation. So in this case, you have, let's say, k categories. So you want to estimate the probability uh, that y equals k, given some observation, then the problem, sorry, the probability that y equals some of the categories given the observation, then you want, also, you want also to estimate the probability that y equals another of the categories given the observation and such and such, but not for k classes, but really for k minus one, because you only have k possible categories, so you have the probability for k minus one of them, you also have the probability for the for the other one because they all add up to one. Uh, well, I already mentioned this about uh, being careful about interpreting these models of logistic regression. Uh, well, in the book, I really don't go uh, quite into detail about this softmax coding scenario, so I will not mention. Okay, so that's mainly it for the case of logistic regressions. Now we're going to be trying to estimate what we saw, I think it was in chapter two, when we saw the, the base classification uh, and that was a, a model for, uh, and that was a model uh, that had the lowest error, the lowest possible error rate. So it was like a, a best scenario model for predicting some category. Uh, and due to that, in this, I think three next models that we're going to be covering, it's going to be mainly different approaches to how we can approximate such Bayesian, Bayesian classification. So first, why don't we try to to approximate such Bayesian model simply using the one that we have just learned, that is using logistic regression. Well, it's, it's because it has some, this model, this logistic regression model has some drawbacks. And let's see some of them. Uh, there's some unstatability with respect to the coefficients, that is the, the beta values with respect to the logistic regression. Uh, and that is if there is a quite clear separation between the two classes, if your response is a dummy variable. Uh, then the set of models that we're going to be covering uh, a little bit later, they turn out to be better predictors than logistic regression. If these conditions uh, are met, that is the predictors, have uh, normal, maybe unidimension, unidimensional or multidimensional distribution, uh, but also the sample size has to be small. Um, and well, they mentioned this, but really, logistic regression can also be generalized to more than two response classes. Uh, but I think they, they don't mention it in the book, but at least in this case for generative modeling, uh, you do get a way to uh, to plot in a, in a dimension that we can visualize, so that can be a two two dimensional plot. Uh, the estimator for the probability or, or some other or some other important uh, value in your model, because when we consider the logistic regression, when you have many predictors and the response has many categories. Uh, we were we were already con working with a multidimensional case, so we were we really couldn't create this S graph because it really it's no longer an S, it's a multidimensional graph, uh, and we don't have a, a nice way to let's say to project such estimations for the probability, uh, so that we can actually see uh, how the model has 
estimated probabilities or how it's working. But with the, with this uh, different set of models, we do get a, a way to, to visualize such models and how they estimate probabilities in, in two-dimensional graphs, for example. Although they don't they don't mention it in the book, but right? in the videos, uh, the authors do, do mention that. So uh, let's set some common notations. K for the response class. Uh, pi sub K is going to be the overall or prior probability. And overall also in the sense of population wise probability uh, that a randomly chosen observation comes from the gate class. Uh, then they're going to be defining this F sub K of X as a pro as a conditional probability of the observation, uh, given that the response is this specific category K. So really, this is the density function of X with respect to the values that have this category as a response. And, and the main idea of this generative models that we are going to be looking at, it's like a flip on what we already covered. We saw ways to, to predict uh, the probability that the response equals some specific category given some observation. We, we use Bayes theorem to flip this, that is to consider the probability that the observation has some specific value given that uh, the response uh, equals some specific category K. And then, uh, as you probably all know from Bayes theorem, you have to multiply such flipped conditional probability by, by two other probabilities. But once you do that, you get that this probability that we've been estimating so far really is also the same as this expression over here. That is this overall uh, probability, then this density, and then simply this is, um, it comes from the total probability theorem. But <coughs> now the idea is that, oh, wait, wait, uh, I didn't define this term, sorry. We're going to be labeling this conditional probability simply as P sub K. That, that is a posterior probability that observation X, well, X, uh, my, how do you say, uh, underscore X? No, no, lowercase X belongs to the K class computed from this specific distribution. Okay, so as I was saying, um, now that we have this probability that we, we want to estimate, how do we estimate it? It's really, a, a, it consists of estimating these values, these, all of these pi sub k and all of these f sub k. And when we, once we estimate such values, then we are going to be uh, estimating also this p sub k and then using the the, the method of the bias classifier to perform our classification of the observation. That is assigning to observation, what is the PK for which the, uh, this value, sorry, which, which is the, the probability, which of these PKs is the largest of all. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, that is uh, estimating the probability of, of the response uh, being some of the categories given an observation, we saw that we are going to estimate such probability, estimating the pi sub case and the, and the densities f sub case. Uh, for the case of the pi sub case, uh, they aren't really difficult to estimate because those are uh, population uh, uh, population proportions. 
So uh, as we know, if you want to estimate such proportion of the population, then you can consider samples of the population and as they get bigger and bigger, then your estimate, that is your, your sample proportion is going to converge to the population proportion that you want. So we already know how to approximate the pi sub k values simply by considering larger and larger samples. But now then how do we estimate these f sub k's uh, density functions? Well, let's start by probably the simplest case that is uh, only using one predictor. And that's going to be the linear discriminant analysis case for this limitation. We're using one predictor and we want to classify an observation to the class for which these probabilities are the greatest. Uh, remember that that is simply what we saw as a bias classifier. The one that gives us a, the smallest possible uh, error rate. So it turns out that it is quite difficult to work with this F2 case. So we really need to, to, do, uh, to use some powerful assumptions about such, uh, about such densities. And uh, we will assume that these F sub case are normal, that is Gaussian, Gaussianly distributed. And uh, they have, each of these have some mean, but all of these distributions, they all share the same standard deviation or, or the same variance, you can say. So from fixing this distribution, what would be the formula for the density? Because we are only working with one predictor, it's simply the usual one. Again, this piece of K, so with this, uh, I think it's called delta, no, it's not delta, sigma. I, I will assume that this character is called sigma. If you know, please let me know. If sigma sub K, uh, uh, sorry, I was saying this, sigma sub K is really the same for all of the possible K categories. Uh, we're simply assuming that they are the same for the linear discriminant analysis. Uh, and so given, given our formula for that piece of K, uh, there is a comment. Uh, okay, thank you, Derek. So, okay, so as I was saying, uh, given the formula that we saw for this PK, these probabilities, now we have this density, how does, so how does the formula change for PK? It's really this expression. And remember, we want to assign to, we want to be classifying via which of this PK is the largest, but we can perform a manipulation of this expression so it doesn't look that as highly. I think they simply take the, the logarithm and that is an increasing function. So uh, what, it, what it all boil, boils down to is that we're, we are going to be assigning uh, the class to an observation for which this delta sub k is the largest. Uh, and that is going to be equivalent that this delta sub k is the largest to the fact that, that this piece of K is a largest. So now the equation, the equation that uh, comes into importance is this expression over here. And as you can see, uh, it is a linear function on X. These are all uh, values that uh, we can estimate. Piece of K, I already said how we can estimate it. Uh, and then, mu and this variance, and well, they can be calculated thanks to the fact that we have made this assumption about uh, normal distribution for the densities. And in this scenario, they're considering two possible values for the response. So again, it's a dummy variable and only one predictor. So over here, we, we are um, plotting the densities, this F sub K, and the point where they meet, that is this uh, average of the means uh, from this point, uh, such vertical line is the uh, Bayes decision boundary. Uh, and what that implies is that uh, fixing uh, 
Uh, how do you say? Um, starting from this line over here, this vertical line, the values to the left, uh, they would be classified as green. And then the values to the right, they would be classified as, uh, uh, I think it's pink or purple. Uh, I think they label it as pink. Uh, and really that's the main idea of this linear discriminant, discriminant analysis. That is, we start with this formula. This one for the possible PKs. Um, we estimate the pi subcase and the f subcase, but the linear discriminant analysis uh, takes an extra assumption about the fact that this f subcase, uh, they have to have a um, Gaussian distribution. This mu subcase, we can simply estimate it via, via this sum. This variance, uh, we also have a formula for that. The pi sub case, I really mentioned how can we estimate it. So as you can see, we can estimate all of these parameters uh, in order to obtain this function. Uh, sorry, sorry, these k functions that we are going to be using to determine how to classify an observation. And we simply classify uh, to the category for which this delta sub k is, lar is the largest. So that was the case for only one predictor. So now we are, we're still working in the case of LDA, linear discriminant analysis, but now uh, we, are going to, we are going to be considering more than one predictor. Uh, it's really very similar to the, other, the previous case. We, we will still be assuming that this F sub k function, these densities are Gaussian, are normal. However, they are they are now normal, but multidimensional ones. So this is how they are defined. They are normal. They have a mean, but now we don't fix um, some variance, but really we fix some covariance metrics. And again, we, we assume that for each of the k categories, they all share the same covariance matrix, but they can possibly have a different mean. In this case, in, in this graphic to the left, there is no correlation between predictors X1 and X2, but in this graphic to the right, uh, the, this, this veil looking singly is not completely symmetric, so we can conclude that there is some correlation between the predictors x1 and x2. So this is how the formula for the density changes. Now for this multidimensional Gaussian distribution, uh, we had our, our covariance metric sigma. They are taking the determinant. And over here, really, it's simply another way to, to, to work with this distribution. But the main idea is that now that we have an estimate for f, we replace it into the previous formula that we had for p sub k. And then that now that you have your p sub k, I think again, you take some logarithm and you get to this, I think it was called discriminant function. And as we can see, they are still over here in this part. This discriminant function is still only linear with respect to the observation. Uh, and the other set of parameters, uh, we can estimate it uh, from the from, from the training data set. Now, how does the Bayesian boundary, no, Bayesian decision boundary look? It's again really just lines, sorry, a collection of lines. In this case, uh, such boundaries defined by these three dotted, no, dashed lines. Uh, they are, partitioning the plane into these three possible categories or, or classes. Okay, so in this part, our classification, uh, there is an, inter um, an important concept that 
that arises, and that is a confusion matrix. Uh, and, and that is mainly a concern about the true, pos the true positives or, or the false positive that our classification model is, is giving us. So uh, let's, see about, let's see about these comments. Uh, Uh, well, they are, they are not showing the specific table where these two parts become quite important. Uh, let's see, I have it over here. Maybe I can show it. It's, okay, it's over here. So in this case, uh, there have been some predicted values for the classification. Uh, yes, the predicted default status. In the case of no, uh, there have been declassifications. There was a match between no as predicted and no as true default. So this was a true positive. In this case, uh, yes was predicted for the default status, but the true default was no. So this is a false positive. There are 23 of such cases. Then uh, they, predict, they predicted no when the true default was yes. So that is a, a false negative. And we saw 20, 252 of them. And in this last case, uh, the predicted uh, category was yes, but the true response was also yes. So uh, they, they are simply a, a good prediction. And there, there are eight, 81 of them. So this part over here, uh, well, I don't want to highlight this question. These numbers, this, this, and this, this is what they were uh, mentioning to be the confusion metrics. And this part over here is that for, our, for knowing how good our classifier has been, uh, we, can, uh, we can consider how well did it perform for these uh, two types of errors. This, uh, let's see, these false positives and these false negatives. So, of course, we can, because they are the bad cases, these 23 plus 252 cases, these are the bad ones. We can, consider, we can calculate an overall error of the error rate of the classification. Um, in this case, this is the error rate, but as, he, as they mentioned over here, in some specific fields like medicine and, bi and biology, it can be important to not fo not focus only in the in the global error rate, but in the error rate and with respect to every category in the response. That is looking at these these specific columns. For example, over here, there were twenty three, let's say, bad predictions out of how many out of almost ten thousand. So that's really not not quite bad. Right. But in this case, there were 252 wrong predictions out of how many? Out of 333. So that is almost like 70% error rate. So that's really, really bad. Uh, and, and that is what I mean that sometimes it can be important to reduce the error also column by column, not just globally. Well, they, they mentioned a way to do that via changing the threshold. But I think that if I go in depth into that, I won't be able to cover the whole chapter. So then, uh, well, this is important, this ROC curve. Um, they are comparing the false positive rate, that is these values over here, these 23. 
Um, they are comparing with the true positive rate, and that is this over here. No, wait, uh, this one. No, <laughs> true positive, the only one is positive. I think this one. Uh, and the main idea is that you can get uh, an idea of how well your your classification model has uh, has worked. Uh, not only via looking at this confusion matrix, but but also looking at this curve. And uh, what you want a, a good classification model to to behave as is that this part over here it's really close to this upper left corner. That is your false positive rate is really, really low, but your true positive rate is quite high. So you can use this curve as a comparison between different classification methods. And let's see, Derek says true positive rate equals number of true positives divided by number of false positives. So, oh, okay, thanks for the correction. Ah, they did have the table over here. Okay, so that was the, the first method uh, with respect to these generalized ones. Now, where are we, where are we looking to the quadratic recriminant analysis? And um, it's still, it is still a similar idea of estimating pi sub k and estimating the, the densities f sub k. But now, there is going to be a difference uh, between the variance or also the covariance ma matrices that we are going to be considering for the for the for the density functions. We still make the same assumption that the density functions uh, have a normal distribution. It could be unidimensional or multidimensional, but as we can see here now. The covariance matrix that defines such Gaussian distribution is going to possibly change class by class. So now that we have the estimate for the density, the F sub K, again, similar to, to the previous case, we can perform some calculations to the P sub K, and then I can take some logarithm and we get this value that is still uh, we classify using this function, we classify to, to the category for which this is the largest one. And an interesting part over here is that now this function is no longer linear on x, but as we can see here, it's now quadratic. So now the, the differences, sorry, one of the differences is going to be that the Bayesian decision boundary is not, is not going to be simply some collection of, of lines but it can be more flexible. So it can be some curve. Um, so how do we decide if we use linear, linear discriminant analysis or the quadratic one? Uh, it comes back to one of the ideas of the first chapter is bias variance trade-off. And um, let's see, over here, a positive for the, for the LDA, it, that is, is a K classes share a common variance. Now, if our assumption that the K classes have a common variance, they, if that really is not the case for the data, then this LDA method can suffer from high bias. So the conclusion from, from that is that you can use LDA when there is few training observations uh, or use this quadratic discriminant analysis when the training set is very large or this common variance matrix, uh, it can not be obtained from the data. The data is not showing a, such a type of correlation between the predictors. And as you can see here, uh, for this specific example, this is how the Bayesian decision boundary is changing. This line is for the QDA, 
and then this dash line in, in pink is for the uh, linear discriminant analysis. So to conclude this part about the gen generative models for classification, we again work with this approach of having this formula. Uh, let's, see, let's, let's look at it again. Having this formula over here for a piece of K and having in mind that we are, we are trying to approximate the Bayesian classifier, we needed to approximate this piece of K that really wasn't an issue, but the issue was in uh, approximating these density functions. So over here, we take a look at a different method, and that is uh, the method called naive bias. In this case, we're going to be working with quite a powerful assumption, and that is that the density function uh, is independent among the predictors for every class of the response. So because they are independent, uh, when you can simply multiply these densities, and now they are one-dimensional densities. So they are also easier to work with. Let's see, why does the, why does this method, why is it so powerful? Well, we simplify the problem. We are assuming independence of the predictors uh, with respect to each class. So now due to this, due to this dimensionality reduction, uh, of course, it's easier to work with these one dimensional functions and with these a joint a distribution. It's also, uh, I think it's a three-dimensional function. Uh, also, if we fail in, in this prediction, sorry, in, in, this assumption, in this assumption of this independence between the predictors for every class, uh, even, even if that's the case, we fail in that assumption. If the, if the number of observations is quite, is quite low, then even, even in that case, the, the classification due to this model happens to be quite good. And another advantage is that this method reduces variance. Um, well, now that we have uh, made simpler this problem of estimating these densities, because now it's simply a one-dimensional estimation, then how do you estimate it now? Well, if the predictor happens to be quantitative, you can do as, as we did with the LDA case or the QDA case, and then you have assume such distribution to be normal. Another case is, again, if the predictor is quantitative, then you can use a non-parametric estimate for the this one dimensional density function and you can do that with your data for example when you perform some histogram and you reduce the the width of the beams you you are getting a kind of estimations of the density uh, and it comes back to this idea that you can estimate such density simply via considering these histograms of the of the predictor as the as a beams get smaller and smaller. And, and now in this other case, when the predictor is qualitative, categorical, then you can simply count the proportion of training observations for such predictor corresponding to each class. So it's like a bar chart. Uh, and now, this is, well, these are some possibilities to estimate the density. And of course, now that you have estimated uh, these unidimensional functions, you simply multiply it. And now we have the estimated, sorry, the estimate that we needed for our formula earlier on. Okay, so a summary of what we have covered. And uh, let's see. Well, let me show it the one over here. 
Well, in the case of logistic regression, uh, we saw that the logic depended innerly on next. And in the case of LDA, uh, also the, the discriminant function depended linearly. Uh, but the fact though was that, uh, sorry, not, sorry, not the discriminant function, the, the PK depended linearly, but you could also modify such PK in order to get the log odds expression. And you would also get that such expression, this log odds dependent linearly in X. Uh, if you also perform such transformation of the PKs into a log odds form, then for the QDA, you get that there is a quadratic dependence in the observations. Uh, also, LDA is simply a, a simply restricted version of QDA. Uh, and we saw that because LDA is simply a QDA, but you are making that your covariance matrix is the same for all the for all the densities that you're working with, for all the F sub case. You, you also get that else LDA is a special case of nice bias. Uh, I think that is hard to, to see, but I, I, I think they do cover it in the book. How does one get to that formula? Um, Well, nice bias can, pro can produce a more flexible fit. Let's see. QDA by might be more accurate in the things where interactions among the predictors are important. Uh, I will end that is because we are considering the correlation between them. We are simply getting such values in the covariance metrics that we are considering. I, well, I think they don't mention it over here, but the author also says that there is not really like a concise best method among these LDA, QDA, um, and nice bias. It really, it will depend on in this set of conditions that they, they are being described over here. Uh, and as we saw for Kai nearest neighbors, uh, as we saw in one of the first meetings, uh, it's, it's a good classifier if the decision boundary is nonlinear because this is a non-parametric method. Uh, perhaps let's skip this part about the empirical comparisons. And now there is a special case uh, when the response is not quantitative. So we can use linear regression. So sorry, we can use the regression tools, um, but it's also not categorical. So we cannot use this set of tools that we have just covered. Uh, and one example that I mentioned is when the response is counting a number of occurrences. For example, the number of bikers per hour. Well, in some specific, oh no, sorry, sorry. The number of bikers uh, with respect to some specific interval. And in this case, it's a time interval. And that is per hour. So for this case, we need uh, another set, another method sorry, another model uh, that is going to be what it is called the Poisson regression. Uh, and, and I made fact of this. Uh, Lucio, we're running low on time. Perhaps we could just briefly talk about what we can cover next week. Uh, okay. Mm, because when we're really in the half, we only really got to cover the, the, the half part of the chapter. Uh, the next one, I, I could do the other part and uh, like for the next next meeting, I think it would be what you had signed up for uh, the exercises. Like if like if we are adding one extra session in order to finish this one, is it okay for you? Yes, that's good for me. Okay, so now that's all set. Uh, really, uh, I have nothing else to add. Uh, so if you want to say something or, or really yes, see you next week. No, that's all. And thank you for summarizing the, these concepts. That That is a lot to go through. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Bye.